Well, look at this. I finally decided to start my boot camp exercises. And uh, for you experienced players, it may start out a little slow. Because um, what I envision for this series is it is for it to be um, videos that are, are accessible to everybody, not just experienced players, but people who really know nothing about the game and want an introduction to the game. Um, I know there are some videos out there that cover that, but um, doing these videos interests me. I am married to a teacher and I have taught myself a long, long time ago when I was in graduate school. So teaching people about the ASL system, which is the title of this first episode, um, it's something I've been interested in for a while. Um, personally, I've been playing Squad Leader since 19... late 70s, um, I'm guessing, with the original Squad Leader. Um, I don't think I started playing it immediately when it came out, but shortly thereafter. Um, and I got my start in war games with playing Steve Jackson micro games. That's what got me ultimately interested. And then a buddy of mine from high school, or at that time, junior high, um, got me interested in the original squad leader. And ever since then, I've been playing it on and off um, over the decades. Unfortunately, um, while I was working on my graduate studies and later work. I had a very hectic work life. Like most of us do, we kind of set it to the side and kind of neglected it or didn't play it at all. I didn't play it at all for years, but I kept all of my modules. I continued to buy modules knowing that someday I would be able to have the time, um, if not sooner, definitely later when I retired to be able to pick up the system again, um, which I did a year ago, finally started playing ASL. So I hope to uh, be able to bring some information to new players, starter kit players, and later on in other episodes, um, experienced players. And with all the videos do, all the videos that I make, um, my secondary goal is to learn things myself. Just the act of creating these videos um, makes me look closer at the game. Um, or in the case of Vassal, make me learn um, dive deeper into how Vaso works so I can teach that to people. So it helps me learn by doing. Um, so let's let's learn together. Let's introduce the game to some new players and uh, go from there. A little history on my uh, ASL background. So this first lesson or first exercise, I'm calling it, it's not really an exercise, I'm calling it the ASL system. Um, now ASL seems to get somewhat of a bad rap in the wargaming community. I read and hear a lot of uh, people mostly outside of the ASL community that think the game is extremely hard and extremely intimidating. And I try to communicate to them that the game is only as hard and intimidating as you make it. At its core, the game is actually quite elegant. It, it, can, be very, it can be a very simple infantry only game you can play at the battalion level with just infantry and support weapons, and you can play hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scenarios, and you'll never ride a, run out of things to play and experience uh, in the system. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, which I think most people see the game as, is that you need to absorb every piece of chrome, as we like to call it, in the game system, which is completely untrue. I don't know every piece of chrome in the gaming system. Um, I learned it over time. I'd like to. I'd like to at least experience uh, everything the game has to offer. But I think very few of us, um, unless there are people out there who've been playing for 40 years straight, you know, all the time, um, probably haven't experienced everything the game has to offer. So you can make the game as simple as you want or as complicated as you want. There's no requirement to learn everything in the game, only what you want to experience and how deep you want to go down that rabbit rabbit hole. So that's how I try to position the game to, to new people or people outside the community who look at the game and just think it's this unelegant behemoth of a game, and it's really not. It's really quite elegant once you get down the basic mechanics and uh, system of the game. 
Um, so I'm going to just go through at a high level, um, especially for the new people, what ASL is. So Advanced Squad Leader is a World War II uh, tactical level. It is a, um, I would call it a battalion or company level. Um, platoon level, there are some scenarios out there that are, you know, they're quite small and short. You've got maybe three or four squads and one leader. Um, but you can go beyond company. You can make monster scenarios, and that's that rabbit hole I spoke about um, diving down if you if you choose to do that. Um, the game has, I'm just going to cover the components at a high level. You can see here we've got, I've got two boards butted up against each other. Each other. It uses a multitude of different types of boards. The, the fundamental board, going all the way back to the original squad leader, is the 8x22 geomorphic board, which is common in a few war games. I think, I can't remember if Panzer Leader or Panzer Blitz came out before squad leader, but it was either squad leader or one of the Panzer games that, that sort of uh, came up with the geomorphic type of board where you can butt up boards uh, against a long seam or against the ends, which you can't see in this view. And all the terrain matches up, the road matches up. You can see it's not a perfect match, but you can flip boards, you can combine boards, you can create almost any battlefield of any size from a half board to multiple, multiple boards. And then there are other maps and boards that are historical in nature. This is kind of an abstraction of terrain. In this case, it's probably somewhere in Europe. Um, but there are historical boards that accurately or fairly accurately map the actual terrain of a given encounter or battle during World War II. And those aren't geomorph geomorphic boards. Those are full, full fold-out type of maps. Um, and you usually play a handful of scenarios on sections of it or one very large campaign game on the, on the entire map. On well, the board, um, as most experienced people um, will know, is a hexagon-based grid, very common in wargaming. Um, the distance, the scale for ASL is 40 meters per hex, or um, the way I like to look at it is 40 meters between center dots. So that would be 40 meters. <clears throat> and the center dots always all also act as line of sight checks. So, and I'll get into line of sight in another video um, and how to do line of sight. But a line of sight is to, to be able to engage a target or see a target, um, you have to have trace a line of sight between center points of a hex to be able to shoot or to a vertex if you're doing bypass movement, which I'll get in in another subject. But you can stretch a string between the center dots to see if a line of sight is blocked. That's the purpose of those. So 40 meters per hex. So, you know, this size here is maybe a football field roughly between my uh, index finger and thumb. And um, we have hills, woods, buildings, roads, open ground, fields of grain of various types. Um, you can't see it, but there's a shell hole here. There's a shell hole up in the corner here. There's stone building, walls, hedges. Um, and then there, there are also other terrain features which aren't shown on, on the, these two boards. And then there's Pacific Theater terrain. There's desert terrain. You can superimpose weather conditions. You can superimpose snow, different types of snow, mist, fog, dust. You can simulate, that's that rabbit hole again. You can simulate pretty much anything on, on this terrain and you can build any geographic configuration with the boards, which number I'm guessing, there's well over a hundred boards, official boards, but when you add in all the secondary boards, third party boards, uh, there's there's got to be easily a couple hundred, um, around a hundred, couple hundred boards, uh, eight by 22, they can use to create uh, battlefields for scenarios. So that's a quick summary of how the boards work in ASL. Now, to play ASL on these boards, um, there's a turn-based system that's used, and the turn-based system is a uh, basically what is referred to as a I go, you go, or you go, I go. Um, so each game turn, use my handy whiteboard here, is broken down into 
a player turn, and another player turn. So this, this player would go first and go through his phases. And then this player would go second, go through his phases, and then it would be another game turn. And a game turn, there are usually five to 12, depending on the scenario, game turns um, within a scenario. So each player would go basically five to 12 times, and they would alternate. And each time they alternate once, you increment the game turn on the scenario card. Um, and then each player turn is further divided into phases. So there is the uh, rally phase. I'm just going to abbreviate these. The rally phase, the prep fire phase. The rally phase is a, both players go. The prep fire phase, only the active player goes, whose turn it is. Uh, and then there's the movement phase. Hope I don't run out of room here. Uh, movement phase. And that is a pseudo, pseudo two-player turn. The player whose turn it is does the movement of his units, while the defending player, the other player, can make uh, take shots during the movement phase. Um in an action called defensive first fire. So this is a, a, a two player turn. Doesn't have to be, sometimes the, the player on defense don't, won't take a shot either because they don't see anything or they choose not to, for whatever reason, they may not take a shot. So this is sort of a pseudo two player turn. Um, and then after that is the defensive fire phase, which is sort of a continuation of defensive first fire. It's often called final fire, defensive final fire. Uh, and that's just one player. That's the defending player. He finishes firing any units he didn't fire while the other player was moving. Um, then after the defensive fire phase, there is the advancing fire phase. That's one player. That's the active player who just moved. Uh, he can fire all or some of his units that moved or didn't move, at usually at half firepower, called area firepower. Um, after the advancing fire phase, there is the uh, route phase, where units that are broken, this is a two-player phase, uh, units that are broken have to route to cover, usually a, well, always a building or woods uh, within range with certain rules that they have to uh, follow while doing so. Uh, and then after the advent, or sorry, after the route phase, there are the I'm running out of room here. The advance phase. That's one player. That's the active player's turn. Who's on offense? Uh, he can advance his infantry units one hex, um, unless it's in, into a hex that they're unable. They normally wouldn't be able to enter. And then lastly, there is the close combat phase, which is a two-player. Um, affair. So the active player usually gets into clo close combat by advancing into close combat during this phase. There are other ways to do it. And then um, once close combat is engaged, it becomes a two-player uh, affair until um, someone is eliminated, completely eliminated in close combat, or they're, ab they're able to withdraw uh, from close combat. Um, if it extends beyond this turn, that turns into a melee but I'm getting ahead of myself here. So those are the eight phases. Make sure I did it right. Eight phases of a player turn. So in one game turn, there's two player turns and 16 phases, eight for each one per game turn. Now, each, uh, let me erase this. Each game turn is roughly two minutes. That is a fairly abstract number. That's what's quoted in the rule book. Um, I don't really believe it's two minutes, especially in these really big uh, scenarios that we play. It's it's a complete abstraction. It's I wouldn't take it as 
being literate, I would take it um, as being figurative and with a grain of salt. But that's what uh, is listed in the rule book for the real time, in game time of one turn. So a 10 turn scenario supposedly models a 20 minute battle. It, I don't think it would go that quickly, some of the scenarios that we play. Now let's go over the basic components here. Um, and if anyone has any questions, especially new players or players who haven't really heard of the system and are interested in it, if you have any comments or questions, post them down there and either I will try to answer them or another viewer will try to answer them and see if we can get a discussion going. It may not happen in these uh, early uh, videos, but... Uh, you never know. Someone might uh, have a question, basic question that we can answer. So I'm just going to go over the basic components. There are lots and lots of components, but the meat and potato po components are um, your nationality units. In this case, I'm, I'm going to show the Americans, American counters. So you've got single man counters, which represent a single individual. Uh, in this case, it is Captain Kenneth that I yanked out of the box. You also have individual heroes that can spring into play. Sometimes you start a scenario with a hero. Um, sometimes they can come as a re result of heat of battle during gameplay. They can pop out of a squad during certain conditions. Or a leader can actually become heroic himself, which is very, very cool. Um, there are your basic squad, which represents five to 12 men, um, a full squad. And then you have a half squad, which is essentially half of a full squad. You can see a, a full squad full squads represented by three silhouettes, a half squad by two silhouettes. And then you have crew. Um, a crew has two firepower and crews are needed to man essentially guns, any any ordnance with on a 5 8 inch counter. So guns, large mortars, that sort of thing, which I'll show you here in a sec. And then you also have uh, vehicle crews, which has a one firepower. Um, so tanks, for example, if you knock a tank out in battle, the you roll for the crew survival of the crew, and if they survive, uh, this is the crew that will pop out of out of a vehicle, an armored vehicle. Trucks and jeeps and so on don't have crew. They have an inherent crew, so like one single driver. So when the truck goes down, the driver goes down. And then lastly, on the half-inch counters, you have support weapons. And there's a whole myriad of support weapons in ASL. In this case, I'm showing a medium machine gun. And I'll, I'll go over all the details on the counters, um, the numbers, what that represent, and so on in a follow-up video. Now, there are, like I said, there's a multitude of other counters. There's different quality of squads. There's different support weapons. The quality is this number up in the upper right. There's all, there's light machine guns, machine, medium machine guns, heavy machine guns, bazookas, Panzerfaust, uh, radios, flamethrowers, demo chargers, all kinds of weapons that you can equip your units with to use on the battlefield. And I'll go over some of those in a future video. Now, the other part of the system is, um, and this is the rabbit hole part, right? You can play just in the infantry arena for a long, long time and never play the same thing twice. But let me do the gun first. You can start introducing guns into the system which uses a two hit system. You have to secure a hit to have an effect. And, it, and then you have a result after that, whether it's shooting uh, armor piercing at a AFV or shooting HE at an infantry, um, you have to secure a hit and then a result can occur from that depending on the type of ammunition you are using or that the gun can use. In the case of this gun, it can use both uh, high explosive and, and armor piercing. And it can fire smoke and it looks like it can fire a PDS in 1944 and 45 from the looks of it. Again, that's way down the road. Uh, and then you have vehicles. In this case, I'm just showing uh, an M4. There are also, there's half tracks, Jeeps, trucks, 
um, armored cars, uh, motorcycles, cavalry horses, uh, anything you can imagine that was a vehicle or motor transport in World War II. There's a counter for it and there's rules for it. But the this here is the meat of meat and potatoes of the system. Infantry, leaders, support weapons, guns of different kinds, and vehicles of different kinds. Everything on top of that uh, is chrome. There's fighter bombers. Um, there's there's paratroop landing. There's all kinds of stuff. So that's at a high level. That's the the system. Um, ASL system, the uh, basic components. Now, lastly, for this video, I swore to myself I was not going to make these videos too long because I swear nobody watches the entire videos, but it is what it is. I'm just up here rambling, and however long it ends up being for the things I wanted to talk about, that's how long it will be. So, um, there's three parts to playing ASL. There's the your board setup. The geography, there is your order of battle. Um, your units are gonna that are gonna fight in a uh, situation on said geography, and then there is your scenario card. Uh, in this case, I think this one came out in the Aussie pack that just came out, and it was on my desk, so I pulled it out. So, <clears throat> those are the three things you need to play. You need a place to play units to engage each other and a situation and the scenario card represents the situation in this case it's hickory licking and every asl scenario card looks like this now third party mo par third party ones may look slightly different because they change the design because they're they're basically not asl product or they're not multi-man publishing published products so they they change the look of it, but all the information is still there. So you have a, a historical setup. You have a board configuration that tells you which boards to pull, how to orient them, and which uh, areas are or are not sorry are or are not playable on the board. And then this O5 represents an overlay which can modify the terrain of the board. You've got your victory conditions. So one side has to do, one or both sides has to do something to win the scenario or result in a draw. Sometimes you result in a draw. There's balance information here, which I use occasionally, not too often. It doesn't have a huge effect on the game. And then here is your turn record chart. It tells you how long the scenario is. In this case, five and a half turns. Um, these two markers indicate the Americans and Germans both have uh, units that enter the board on the first turn. If this was, say these icons are shifted to turn three, they would have reinforcements coming in on turns three, each of them. Uh, and then over here, there's uh, the setup information. Germans set up first, Americans move first. Uh, and the numbers in brackets are battlefield integrity. Not many people use that. I have never used Battlefield Integrity. I've never even read the rules. I know the concept of it, but I have never even played using it. And then here you have your orders of battle. Um, usually there's a historical uh, org unit that's listed here. There's an experience level rating uh, for your units. So if you fail a morale check, your units can be reduced in quality. I'll cover that later. There's a sniper activation number. There's sniper mechanics in the game. I'll cover that later. And then here's your orders of battle, um, and it's uh, and then in here it'll say where to set up uh, for the Germans in this case, and the Americans have the same uh, thing. And all scenario cards have the, these exact configuration. And then lastly, any special scenario rules that need to be implemented in the scenario are listed at the bottom of the sheet. Sometimes you can have a very long list of a special scenario rules, and that usually involves weather. Um, conditions or where a certain unit must set up or yeah special overlays that need to be placed like this this one's referring to an overlay here 05 which is an open ground overlay and then here in the lower right is always the historical aftermath so you can re you can read the prelude to the historical engagement then you can read what actually happened and you can weigh that against what actually happened in the scenario as you play it now Obviously, in World War II, 
one side or the other. We know who won the war, right? The Allies won the war. But these scenarios, even though they're based on historical um, battles, the designers still try to balance them so it's not just every scenario isn't lopsided so the allies aren't always winning late war and the germans aren't always winning early war so they try to balance the scenario so it is still a game right to begin with uh, i i've always viewed, viewed asl as a game first a simulation second um, because as a player we sometimes choose to do things that make really don't make any logical sense on a real battlefield but we do it anyway to try to win the game because it's still just a game. So these scenarios, even though they're historically based, they do try to balance them and play test them um, as much as possible. Oh, I'm sorry. That was off the board, wasn't it? Or off the, off the video. Uh, special rules at the bottom here and then the historical aftermath. Sorry about that. Um, that's all I wanted to cover for exercise one. It really wasn't an exercise. It was just a overview to show uh, new people, uh, what the system looks like, um, and introduce them to the game and a little bit about myself before I dive into doing these videos. And this first video is probably long, 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 and I apologize for that. But the exercise two, I'm going to start going into detail on infantry components, what they are, what the numbers represent, some of their basic capabilities. Uh, and then exercise three, I'm gonna start infantry movement, how infantry move. And that may take several, or not several, that may take a couple uh, exercise, exercises and videos to do that. So until then, uh, I hope you find this video series useful. Uh, I'm gonna try to have fun doing them and I hope I learn and keep brushed up in the rules as I go through um, these uh, ASL exercises and drag you guys into boot camp ASL style. Until then, Rolo. Oh, God. <laughs>